Doug, you have a go. Thank you. Okay, it's 7.30 and we're gonna start our meeting. Welcome to the May meeting, the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, the president of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society and Chris Wells, our vice president will be one of our speakers later in the meeting. This is our agenda for tonight. If you have questions during the meeting, you can either put them into the YouTube comments if you have an account that will allow you to do that, or you can email your questions to the email address that's shown at the bottom of the slide, jscaslive at gmail.com. And we will take questions during the presentation and, and uh, each speaker will uh, take, present, take, take questions either during their presentation or in their presentation. So here's our agenda for today. First, we're gonna have Brandon Riddle, who's going to tell us about astrophysics using the ISS, an overview of the AMS and NICER experiments. This will be followed by David Havlin with Star Party News. Then a do-it-yourself astronomy rigging for remote imaging with Chris Wells and Trevor Quinn. That'll be followed by Jerry Campbell, who will be telling us about recollections of James Peebles, a 2019 Nobel laureate in physics for advanced advances in physical cosmology. And then last, we'll have a do it, another do-it-yourself astronomy. I will be doing one on do-it-yourself astronomical spectroscopy. But first up is our main speaker, Brandon Riddle. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Brandon. Brandon Riddell, sorry, I've been mispronouncing his name, Riddell, currently works in the ISS Research Integration Office, helping investigators in giving, getting their research onto the ISS platform. Previously, he spent over 15 years working ionizing radiation environments and effects for various NASA missions. He holds a PhD in physics from the University of Houston and an MS in applied physics from Johns Hopkins University with his interest being in high energy physics and space physics. Brandon enjoys amateur astronomy and is a part of the JSEAS and he occasionally teaches physics and astronomy at UHCL. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brandon. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Um, so this is Brandon Riddell, and thank you, Doug, for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about, um, as we talked about earlier, the astrophysics uh, from the ISS. Um, this is only two experiments I'd like to talk about, and I'm only really going to just kind of give you an overview of the, the science, the hardware, and a couple of the results from each. Um, this, all the information on this particular presentation is all found on the public web. Um, there's plenty of links I've included in this presentation. So if I don't get to any questions, uh, answers to your questions, um, a lot of the answers can be found on the links uh, provided in this presentation. And so the agenda, I wanna spend a couple minutes reviewing the, the history of the universe, right? From, from the Big Bang creation all the way up till the present day. And, and that sort of sets the background of why uh, the interest of these two experiments. Then I'll provide an AMS overview and then a NICER overview and then talk a little bit about where we can find all this cool information on the on the space station. And by the way, uh, throughout the talk, um, as Trevor mentioned earlier, feel free, or, or Doug mentioned this, feel free to email questions in and uh, it's not an interruption. I know this is a virtual event, so I'll do my best to answer all your questions. So, Here's an image uh, of many that you can find on Google, uh, uh, just kind of illustrating the Big Bang. And so from a history historical perspective, we know the universe is about 13.7 billion years old, and it's expanding outward ever since the beginning at time zero. Um, for the era between time equals zero to 10 to the minus 43 seconds is the Planck era. General relativity tells us time, space, matter, and energy all came into existence, uh, beginning at this singularity. The four fundamental forces were all unified into a super force, and the best theories today tell us that there was at least nine or 10 dimensions plus one time dimension. Between 10 to the minus 43 and minus 36 seconds, we call this the grand unification epoch, and it's basically um, all four forces were together, and then we first see gravity separating, and we also see some of the earliest fundamental particles uh, starting to show up here, including their antiparticles, and I'll talk more about that later. And then from 10 to the minus 36 seconds, you know, so that's a zero with 0 0.36 zeros and a one. We're talking about that fraction of a second. 
Um, between 10 to the minus 36 and 10 to the minus 32 is the inflationary epic. And that is a unique event that's a lot of people think it's triggered by the separation of the strong nuclear force from the super force. But it's a period of time where the universe goes through a massive expansion. It expands up 26 orders of magnitude in the matter of uh, you know, 10 to the minus 33, 32 seconds. Just a fraction of a second, it grew to about 10 centimeters in size. So uh, also during this event, only three of the six spatial dimensions, as we know of them, length, width, and height, um, also expanded during this phase. The other six are believed to be coiled up around these three and are really the, the, the centerpiece of a lot of experiments today looking for these extra uh, dimensions. So moving on, um, and the next era is the electroweak era. And that was uh, from about 10 to the minus 32 seconds to 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So we're, we're approaching the one second mark. During this time, the period the the period of time where the strong force is uh, it's been separated and we have more particles created, more massive particles uh, 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 through their interaction with the Higgs field and so forth. And then from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus six is the quark epoch. And so this is where we really see uh, these particles called quarks and anti-quarks start to appear. Um, we also have the electroweak force breaking up during this time. Um, so basically from this time all the way till present day, so from less than one second to present day, we've had these four fundamental forces um, that we uh, are used to seeing. That's gravity, electricity, magnetism, called elect electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. And then really quickly from 10 to the minus six seconds up to about one second is called the Hadron Epic. And that's just basically the production of larger particles uh, like protons and neutrons, which are the basis of our whole chemical, all of our chemical elements that make up the periodic table. Everything, all the matter that we know of is made out of hadrons. And so this is the kind of the time frame where a lot of the hadrons were produced. And there were still a lot of interactions going on because the universe was very hot at this time. And then during the first three minutes, uh, Stephen, ha uh, Stephen Weinberg at the University of Texas, he actually wrote a famous book called The First Three Minutes. Uh, so this is where big bang nucleosynthesis starts to happen. This is where through collisions and fundamental interactions where we get these elements building up. And uh, the first, the, the lightest elements, uh, hydrogen, helium, trace elements of uh, isotopes of helium, lithium, uh, deuterons, Tri tri tritons and things like that. All these types of light particles were all formulated at this point in time. And then as the universe is getting older, out to about 300,000, 380,000 years ago, uh, after the Big Bang is when the temperature uh, cooled down just enough where light uh, could actually uh, leave for the first time. I mean, before that, it was so hot that light was interacting with all the electrons and, and so forth. And so you may have heard of the cosmic microwave background radiation. That is the light released at about when the universe was 380,000 years old. Um, and the subject of a lot of experiments too, satellite experiments. And then from basically 380,000 years to about 150 million years, uh, it was a period of time when uh, going from no stars to the first stars. Um, those were called population three stars. Um, very uh, uh, low metallicity, uh, meaning mostly hydrogen and helium type stars. Uh, and then basically from the hundred, couple hundred million years all the way to present day is uh, our present state, which is just more and more stars and, and the production of galaxies to make you know, really what the universe, what we know of it as today. Um, so really the, the real agenda here is really to answer these three questions. So, so we, we, we have a very general overview of, of sort of the history, right? So you kind of heard a lot of these terms thrown around, but there's some big problems that we physics doesn't know about still, and we're still active research, uh, uncovering these. And that's the purpose of what AMS and NICER is about. Um, one question is, where did all the an antimatter go? You know, the Big Bang Theory predicts equal amounts of matter and antimatter, but there's some imbalance. Current theories predict 
uh, that for every 10 billion antimatter particles, there's 10 billion and one matter particles. So this is, uh, so the question is, you know, did it all annihil annihilate say, itself or has it all collected in some other place? You know, perhaps there's antimatter galaxies where it's all pulled out in some location. We just don't know, but we know from our location, all we see is matter. Um, the second question, what is the nature of dark matter? So I didn't really talk much about it because we don't know what it is, but we do know it exists. It doesn't interact with electromagnetism like most matter. Therefore, it doesn't emit light. Uh, the bottom left picture there shows uh, energy, the mass energy content of the universe. And so when you look at all the mass and, and all the energy and convert it to, let's say, energy, 68% of the universe is considered dark energy. And that's related to the expansion rate of the universe. It's sort, it's sort of tied up into the fabric of space-time. Hey, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, we have a question that came in that uh, is asking when all the particles of standard uh, of the standard model are present. Uh, when, when when do they become present? Yeah. So uh, it is probably so. I talked about the quark era, uh, ranging from I believe is about ten to minus twelve seconds to ten to minus six seconds. Um, and then following that was the the hadron era. So by by this time, you've had all the all the flavors of the the six flavors of uh, quarks, uh, the six flavors of the leptons, which is you know leptons, uh, muons, nu uh, neutrinos, and muons and things like that. So I think most people, it's kind of around that time frame within a second, a few seconds, let's say. Um, and then all the time after that is just really the physics of the four fundamental forces interacting and building uh, larger building blocks. That's a good question. Hopefully that answered it. Uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, so lo looking here at the left, bottom left corner here, this, I was talking about the percentage of dark matter. So, um, so one thing that's surprising to people so when astronomers look out into space and you look at all the stars and all the galaxies and all the, you know, all the planets, when you look at the total content of the universe, the stuff that we can see only makes up about a half of 1%. Okay, so that, that little section of the pie there that says 4.9%, um, that is all the matter, all the stars and galaxies and all that, but that also includes a lot of the interstellar dust and the dust that's intertwined in the uh, in the large filament structure of the universe. So that's gas that we directly can't see. So some people call that ordinary dark matter in the sense that we can't really see it, but it's ordinary matter. But all the stars and galaxies that we see only make up about a half of 1%. Um, the rest of the mass of the universe is all tied up into this stuff called dark matter. And we know it exists by looking at rotation curves of galaxies and um, lensing effects uh, and so forth. And then uh, some other motivation for these two experiments, um, you know, so much later in time after we actually have stars and then you have uh, the lifetime of stars, um, we know that some stars that are massive uh, go through a supernova and you're left with a neutron star. And so that's what NICER is about. And, you know, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But some of the big questions are what's inside of a neutron star? You know, what's the state of matter? Um, you had a lot of mass compressed into very small spaces. They think these stars are only approximately 10 miles in diameter. Uh, uh, you know, um, we know they're compressed neutrons and protons, electrons make neutrons. Um, but we also know there's other types of quarks. Um, when you look at the inner core, the, the pressures and densities are so intense there that there's some theories that predict that we could have what's called strange stars or strange quark stars there. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, so, so these are just the three topics really that's composing the outline of this talk and the motivation of the alpha magnetic spectrometer and NICER. And so let's talk about the AMS first. Um, so here, hopefully everybody's seeing the space station. I'm on chart five here. So this is the view of the ISS um, as if it's flying away from you. Okay, so we're kind of looking at the backside. 
And so this is just showing kind of a large scale structure. Um, both of these experiments are big payloads uh, mounted on the outside of space station on the right side. That's the port side. Um, the AMS is that big square looking one there. And we got more pictures coming up. And then nicer is that little square looking one that's kind of hanging off on the top at an angle. That's nicer. So the alpha magnetic spectrometer dash zero two. Okay, so when I say zero two, that probably means you're thinking there must have been a first one. Uh, and there was. AMS-01 was the precursor and it flew on the space shuttle uh, STS-91 uh, back in June of 1998. And it was a 10-day mission. Um, and it collected real science. Uh, you can think of it as a slightly scaled down version of AMS-02. Um, uh, uh, it, they've actually published, I, I got the links. If you go to those links, uh, the first link down there, you can find the, I think there's about eight papers published on that. It collected about 80 million uh, particles during that 10 days. And there's some interesting results just from that alone, but that that exactly proved that the technology works. You really can put large uh, particle detector type experiments in space that have large magnetic fields uh, and large sizes and very complex um, calorimetry as well. Uh, so feel free to take a look at those links. I'm not going to talk much about AMS-01, but there was a lot of turmoil from the time between AMS-01 and AMS-02. Uh, so I'm not going to read all this chart, but if you go to Wikipedia, you can find some of the history. Um, the things I would like to highlight are, uh, so, you know, we had the shuttle Columbia disaster in 2003. The fleet was shut down for a while. Um, we all know that the space shuttles were retired in 2010 timeframe. Uh, so during all this time, AMS was sort of under the way to, to do a reflight. And the idea was to launch at the space station. Um, but there was cost a lot of money. It's big science, kind of like one of those big CERN type experiments uh, that we see um, over like the Large Hadron Collider. Not, not big like the hard, Large Hadron, but like one of the experiments on the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, 2006, there was a big study, uh, basically, uh, saying that it, it's just going to be too big and it's too hard to do. Um, let's not do it basically. But Samuel Ting, he's a professor, uh, Nobel laureate at MIT. It's, he's the main PI for this experiment. He just fought hard and he went into to Congress and got a, uh, international collaboration going. And in 2008, uh, they got some bills pushed through, starting to get pushed through the House of Representatives, uh, then Senate, and so forth. And it was actually signed into, approved and signed by George W. Bush in October 2008. And so what that did is basically that re that actually set aside a whole space shuttle flight just to launch this uh, experiment. And, and it happened in 2009 when uh, it was uh, uh, added to the manifest, and it was launched in 2011. And so I, I show this picture here on the right. There's actually a really interesting um, uh, video you can see. I know it's on Amazon Prime. You can probably see it on YouTube, probably. Um, it's actually really interesting to see the historical and international uh, uh, hoops hoops they went through to get this uh, experiment up on Space Station. Hey, Brandon, uh, yes. real quick. Uh, another question. Is the AMS a magnetic spectrometer? Yes. Yes, AMS uh, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, and I'm going to go over some of the hardware here in a few minutes. So, um, but yeah, it's a it's a magnetic spectrometer. Uh, real quick, this is just the if you go to the AMS02 website, I have there on the bottom. This is their current collaboration. I believe it's about 44 institution institutions. So you can see that it expands pretty much all the continents. Um, I'm not sure if there's any from Australia, but certainly China, Europe. Um, it's real big, uh, a lot of the U.S. as well. And um, if you actually go to some of the scientific papers that I'll talk about at the end, um, you know, there's like the first two pages are just filled up with all the principal investigators. It's a huge collaboration. So this is the picture of the AMS before it was launched, just to give you an idea. Um, it is approximately five meters by four meters by three meters and seven and a half tons on the Earth. And so this is a cartoon, it's a little bit blurry, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the hardware. So this, in the center here, is sort of like a slice through the, the detector. 
And um, it's really comprised of about six uh, different types of detectors. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one and I have a couple better pictures. But um, the you have a transition radiation detector that that's a whole its whole purpose is just to look for positrons. That's E plus and uh, regular electrons. Um, so we're measuring electrons and positrons. Um, Z is the charge of particles. So even for higher particles, like for instance, carbon has six protons. So um, a Z of six would be a, a carbon atom. Uh, P is momentum. So we have these silicon trackers that help uh, de delineate what the charge is in the momentum, which is also related to the energy. Um, we also have multiple detectors measuring energy and uh, tra uh, trajectories. Um, one of the questions just now was talking about an alpha magnetic spectrometer. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, but it's, it's a large magnet that creates a magnetic field. And when these particles zip through the detector, because of the Lorentz force, they like to bend around the magnetic field lines. And so depending on how massive they are and how much energy determines kind of how much they bend. And so if you can measure that, that deflection, then you can get an idea of um, what type of particles those are. And if it bends one direction, it's matter. And if it depends uh, the, the opposite direction, then that's antimatter. And so we have this, the time of flight, uh, detectors, the magnet itself, and something called the rich. Um, that's a, uh, another detector. So I'm going to talk about these here briefly. So uh, yeah, here's the main magnet. So this is the core of the experiment and why it's so large, a part of the reason why it's so large. So it's made up of 64 high grade uh, uh, iodium iron boron sector type magnets that are fit together in large sectors. Uh, they're assembled so that uh, uh, basically in a cylindrical shell, it's about almost a meter long um, uh, uh, in the inner and out to 1.1 meter on the outer side. Uh, let's see, it produces a magnetic field about 1.4 kilogauss in the X direction in one direction. So the picture on the left shows 1500 gauss. So to give you an idea, the Earth's magnetic field is 500 gauss. So this is about, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, a half a gauss. So this is about 300 times uh, uh, more massive than the Earth's field. Um, so that's the core of the magnet. Uh, Brandon? Yep. Uh, we have another question. Are the detectors like the ones used by particle accelerators? Yes. Yeah, they're almost the exact same ones. Uh, you know, most particle accelerators use very precise uh, silicon-based detectors because you want, basically, you want to create an electric signal when the charged particle zips through them. So they're they're very common. You know, there's there's ones that are better than others. It kind of depends on the type of particles you're focused on, but they're a very standard set that you find in just about all the major experiments. Um, for instance, at the Large Hadron Collider, for instance. So so. I like to think of this experiment as kind of like a CERN type experiment, but it's up on space. It's a full up particle physics accelerator uh, detector. Uh, let's see the silicon tracker. Um, so basically, I was telling you earlier, it measures uh, momentum and charge. So from that, you get this thing called rigidity. Um, if you think of, of a rigid piece of metal, right, that's something that doesn't bend. So rigidity is related to the momentum of a particle divided by its charge. It's basically a measure of its momentum, total momentum. And, you know, if you think of it, the higher the, the velocity and the bigger the mass, the more momentum it has, right? Think of a billiard ball versus a bowling ball moving, right? The heavier one's got more momentum to it and it's harder to deflect it. And so that's um, related to the magnetic field and the, the charge and the magnet. Uh, and the momentum, if you can measure these things and measure the deflection angle, you can actually back out um, the charge. And so uh, the, I'm not going to read through all this, but the, the tracker has a bunch of different planes of silicon trackers that have many channels to help get a precise measurement of this deflection of the uh, particle because of the magnetic field. Uh, next is... Um, so something called the transition radiation detector. 
And so here again, we're still looking at particles, but this one's helping to separate out uh, um, pro uh, electrons and positrons. And so again, this is a similar uh, silicon-based uh, 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 detector. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the detectors use these things called proportional tubes. Um, so this has 5,000 mounted all around it. You can see these are very large detectors and they're kind of mounted all around the outside of the, the hardware. Um, uh, it has 328 modules mounted in 20 different layers. Um, that makes up the 5,248 gas tubes in there. And so a lot of these detectors have to be cooled down um, from, uh, from gases like carbon dioxide and xenon. And I'll talk a little bit about that because the AMS did some several EVAs last year to basically fix up, replace some of the coolant system on, on, the, on the vehicle to extend its life. Then we have something called the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter. A calorimeter just measures the energy and charge of particles also. It's um, kind of more, a little bit more precision um, uh, in different energy range, but it basically when, it, if you look at the left-hand picture here, you have an electron or positron coming in and it interacts with this lead foil here and it causes a shower, of, like a cascading effect of particle interactions. And that sort of amplifies the signal. And so, um, this is a very precisely layered uh, detector that has 98 lead foils on it and 50,000 scintillating fibers. So some, some very precise measurement of um, some of the energy distribution. Something called the RICH I talked about earlier, that stands for Ring Imaging Cherenkov uh, Detector. And uh, so there's something called the Cherenkov effect when you have a particle that exceeds uh, um, the velocity of light in a material, uh, it, it creates uh, like a light cone that spreads out ahead of it. And this, the shape of that light cone is related to uh, um, the charge basically. And so this is effectively one of the tech detectors using um, to measure charge. And so it needs photo sensors, and there's 10,880 of these mapped around the wall of this rich uh, device um, layer. And by the way, on each one of these pages, I have a link that goes in and shows uh, um, more detail that you can get some of this uh, information for. So the time of flight detectors, uh, so they're effectively uh, measuring the energy uh, deposited per unit length. And it's just measuring uh, this DEDX for cosmic rays. And it, and it also acts like a stopwatch for a particle um, as they transit through. So there's one at the top. There's a top layer on the left side right here, and then a bottom layer. And so they're only interested in particles, in this case, going up and down through the detector. And so when it passes through both planes, you, you kind of have a starting pulse and an end pulse. So that, that helps uh, identify the type of particles and to sync up with the other detector so that we know which particles traveling through each of the other detectors. Okay, so th that's really all I wanted to say on the hardware. I mean, that's a lot of, it's pretty complex stuff. Um, I just really wanted to give you an overview, but certainly feel free to look at those links. Um, a lot of the experiments uh, on space station um, are controlled from uh, remote centers. So this is actually an image I took a uh, snapshot off their webpage back in March um, of the AMS control room, and it's out at CERN uh, in Geneva. And so if you actually go to this web page, what they actually show is, um, you know, at this particular date, they've collected 155 billion particles to date uh, and counting. But what you have is a whole dedicated team of, uh, of all the people looking at all the different hardware and some of the science going on, and it takes a big staff to, to do this. And so they're in sync with uh, communications um, through Houston and, and Marshall Space Flight Center to downlink the data and do any commanding that's necessary. Uh, this is an interesting picture to give you a little bit more perspective. So this was, um, if you look carefully, 
so this is looking, you're, you're kind of near the center of the station. You're looking out along the truss. And so these big things out here, there's solar arrays. And um, what you have here is an astronaut here doing an EVA and another astronaut here on the truss doing an EVA. And so that kind of gives you some perspective of the size of the AMS um, relative to, um, uh, you know, the size of a human body. Um, okay, so I talked a little bit about the hardware, you know, where it's located. Uh, so I, I was kind of telling you early on, there's really three things we're looking at, antimatter, dark matter, and neutron star. So AMS is really mostly focused on uh, trying to answer the big questions about where did the antimatter go and what is dark matter. And so I actually took this from one of Sam Ting's slides. He's quoting a paper. As far back as 1990, uh, Ed Witten's one of the main particle physicists. Um, a lot of people, uh, including Turner and Wilczek, uh, hypothesized about this mysterious subject called um, dark matter. Um, some of the fundamental particles that extend the standard model beyond the standard particles um, into a set of um, interesting particles that are all hypothetical at this stage, um, things called neutralinos and axions. Um, so those are some of the candidate lead candidates for what these what they think dark matter may be made of. And so what they're in, what they're interested in looking at is that we know we can't direct these axions directly, but when they do interact with themselves, they do produce uh, electrons and positrons and, and even antiprotons. And so the idea is, you know, we get a lot of data from cosmic and regular astrophysics type sources. And so we know what the ordinary cosmic rays are. So any signal above that would be in possibly an indicator of um, this dark matter if it matches what the theory predicts. And so that's what this graph's showing here. The graph on the left is showing the positron fraction versus energy. And so this green curve is just normally what we expect from what we know about astrophysics processes and stars and so forth and then the, the regular cosmic rays we see. But if this axion interaction is actually happening and producing extra positrons uh, as a function of energy, we expect that there should be an extra signal increasing all the way up to high energies and then dro dropping off um, sharply at high energy. And that purely depends on the mass of the axion. And similarly with antiprotons, uh, we expect, you know, uh, at low energies, it's probably hard, you can't distinguish between uh, the production of antiprotons from dark matter or cosmic rays, but at higher energies, you start to see a separation here. And so that's some of the things they're looking for. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the results. Uh, so here's what the AMS has found so far on positrons. In this publication, um, here's the title of it, and it had the link at the bottom. And uh, I think it's free, so you should be able to find the paper. Uh, it came out last year, and it was it was an update to a previous version. So there's a couple of versions. Um, as they get more and more data, they get better statistics and update these calculations. Uh, so. What has been found so far is that at high energies, there is an additional source of positrons. So these plots show the positron flux versus energy, and they clearly show an increase of flux at high energy. It peaks, and then at so they, uh, it peaks at energies, let's say several hundred GeV. So that's uh, in this range between the blue and brown, if you will. All right, so it's peaking out a couple hundred MeV, uh, GeV, that's a billion electron volts, and then it's dropping off fairly quickly. And so uh, in this chart, just showing some modeling, um, showing distributions from two different source terms. So what, what they're showing is that they believe there's, an, there's some other source generating these high energy positrons at very high energies that are different than the main source term producing most of the ones that we see that we know about from cosmic rays and, and astrophysical processes. Again, uh, a companion paper that came out along with this study uh, uh, also came out last year. It's focusing on the measurement of the electrons, the high energy electron. Um, 
and it does not show the same trend, right? You don't see a high energy peak. You just see the electrons falling off. Uh, so often electron, we know through a lot of physics processes, oftentimes electrons and positrons are created in pairs. Um, but this, there's a huge difference here at high energy uh, between the positrons and electrons. So this tells us that there is definitely two different sources for that's producing the electrons and positrons. And so that was some, some big news from uh, uh, in this particular realm. Um, so what about antimatter? Um, so the AMS, uh, with all of its instrumentation, can detect uh, the antiparticles for all the light elements up to oxygen and so forth. Now, the higher we go up the peri periodic table, the less, the more rare they are, and the less uh, statistics you get. Um, so that means to see the same number, you'd have to sit out there longer. So. Some of the first particles they're looking at are called deuterons. So that's a deuteron is just a, it's like a heavy proton. It's got a proton and a neutron stuck together. And so it still has a charge of one because of the proton. But these have never been observed in space before. But, uh, but in May 23rd, uh, uh, 2018, uh, the results presented, um, I have a link there. I'd, I encourage you to go look, listen to that. That's actual Samuel Ting himself. They video recorded it. Uh, talked a lot about these charts, and he's showing, <clears throat> excuse me, he's showing some of the uh, results they're getting. So they actually have found uh, a charge, a Z equals minus one, so that's the minus the antiparticle, and it has a predicted mass um, fairly close uh, to that of what we would expect from a deuteron. And so they're fairly confident uh, you know, they've, they're seeing deuterons. And so the trick now is let's collect more of them. And so <clears throat> this particular graph here is over time, you're measuring the flux versus energy. And so um, from the theory, uh, we would expect um, sort of the tailing off of deuteron production at high energies based on the theories, that would be the red band of particles. Whereas um, from cosmic ray sources, we know it extends, it has a slightly different distribution. So the goal is to measure distributions and see if we are seeing a dark matter uh, type distribution. And so this will only come with time and we're not there yet. With it. So the next, next uh, higher uh, 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 particles, uh, helium, charge of two. Um, so that, again, these are very rare. Uh, they have not produced a full up uh, presentation uh, or excuse me, uh, presented their data yet on helium. Uh, but again, if you go back to this presentation here in the link, you'll see that they do talk about that they are measuring uh, various isotopes of helium. Uh, one of the primary ones is, uh, so they've seen, um, as of 2018, they have, have had at least eight identified of Z equals minus two. Um, in the range between zero and 10 GeV with very high precision uh, momentum. Um, the very first one was reported back in 2016, and these are the numbers for the charge and mass. So this is really, really close to the 3.0, which is what we'd expect for a uh, Z equals two and atomic mass three uh, heavy uh, uh, helium particle. And then uh, regular and Brandon, Brandon, before you go on, uh, what is the Z slash A in the chart? Z, Z is the charge and A is the atomic mass. So when you, when you look at a periodic table of elements, um, Z is basically your number of protons and A is your protons plus your neutrons. So for, for instance, for regular helium, that's what I'm going to talk about on this slide here. Um, helium-4, that's the common helium that we, we know about. So you have uh, two protons and two neutrons uh, in the nucleus. So because you have two protons, each one of those is charge of one. Um, so you have helium has charge two. It's number two on the periodic table of elements. The four means you have a proton and a neutron have the same atomic mass, so uh, in atomic mass units. So 
uh, that's where the four comes from. There's four particles. Uh, uh, Brandon, one more. Sure. Uh, isn't the solar wind a source of deuterons? Um, I, I'm sure there's some that exist in there, but the solar wind is primarily the atmosphere of the sun blowing off, and it's primarily electrons and positron uh, uh, protons. Um, there, there are trace elements of higher elements, uh, heavier elements, but um, you know, there's there's deuterons and lithium or uh, tritium and things like that. That's like helium three and heli various isotopes of helium. So they they would be in the solar wind. I wouldn't say it's a dominant source. Um, I think their fluxes, they're not as high as the electrons and the uh, uh, protons, though. But they, yeah, you're right. They're they are in a source in the solar wind. Uh, on on that front, um, the the particles coming out of the solar wind are probably much lower energy though than this. The ones that are being measured by AMS, the ones that come from cosmic rays and possibly uh, dark matter interactions, uh, we're expecting uh, lower. So it's it's low low energy to mid mid energy range, um, but these higher ones from cosmic ray sources are, uh, you know, they, it has to do with the astrophysical processes of the of the cosmic rays traveling across the universe, being accelerated at shocks and um, uh, magnetic fields and so forth like that. It's a good question. Uh, real quick on uh, helium, let's see. Uh, yeah, so helium-4 is an even more rare event. So this chart here on the right, um, I just wanted to show you that that's the first time it's ever been measured in space. This is actually an image from the AES co collaboration showing kind of a, it's sort of like a particle track for that particular event going through a cross section of their detectors. That's what this, hor this vertical line is right here. And so they, they measured a mass of 3.73 with a charge of minus two. So. That's the first uh, evidence of uh, ever measured of anti-helium in space. And so I just wanted to summarize, there, there's some, there's several papers kind of looking at theoretically, if you, uh, depending on the dark matter models you use, what trying to make predictions of what we would see and, and seeing if it makes sense with, with the data we're seeing. And so when later on, when we get to the end, I'm going to give you a link that you can find some of these papers. Um, but until we get more data, um, it's going to be really hard to confirm some of this. Uh, again, this these particular uh, quotes here are taken from Samuel Ting's presentation last year, but they're really expecting a lot of these answers and better statistics um, by 2024. So another four or five years, um, they expect to have um, better error bars enough where they feel confident they can publish some of this and make some actual claims that um, – might indicate that we're seeing uh, evidence of dark matter. And so this would go a long ways towards helping those dark matter models. And then likewise for uh, carbon and oxygen, uh, it's the same thing. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they have these various layers in the detector through the uh, silicon trackers. And so they have to spend a lot more time analyzing them. Um, they haven't seen a whole lot of events, but by 2024, uh, um, you know, they're seeing a lot of regular matter events, but not a whole lot of anti-events. So they need more statistics. So by they're saying by 2024, you know, when you look at the collection of positive charge versus negative charge, they should have some good statistics to help sort out um, some of the theory predicting these anti-carbon and anti-oxygen results. So stay tuned is what we're trying to say here. <laughs> and then finally, I wanted to touch base. Um, so earlier, uh, somebody asked uh, questions, and I was talking about the quark, the quark era. Um, so a lot of you may know that, you know, there's there's quarks out there. There's six of them: up, down, strange, charmed, bottom, and top. Um, but when you think about everything you can touch and feel, all the matter that you know of everything's pretty much made out of up and down quarks. But that doesn't mean they can't exist. Um, matter can't exist that's 
say you swap out an up quirk and put a strange quirk in there. And so there are theories um, that predict you, as far back as during the quirk era, during the Big Bang processes, that there could be matter made up of strange quirks instead of up and down quirks. And so we call these uh, strangelets or strange matter. And so um, since the mass of a strange quirk is a lot more than um, uh, an up or down quirk, if matter is truly made with some strange quirks in it, it's going to have an atomic number much bigger than uh, for, let's say, the atomic number for an equivalent element made out of up and down quarks. And so, for instance, if you look at a diamond, if you take the ratio of Z over A, it's about a half. It's like that for a lot of particles. If it's actually made out of strangelets, um, because the A is so much larger, we would expect to measure the ratio uh, much less than that. And so a lot of these answers, um, if you, I'm going to back up a chart or two here. Uh, so I kind of skipped over this, but if, if matter is actually, this is the helium plot. These are the number of events versus energy. Uh, if, if it's possible to measure antiparticles or particles that have a t completely different mass ratio. And so once they build up enough statistics, if they start seeing a distribution down in here, then we, that could be evidence that, um, that, uh, you know, we're measuring matter that's not purely made of up and down quarks that perhaps there could be some strange matter. So that that's actually an interesting thing, but there's nothing to publish on that right now. A lot of that statistics base. And, um, Again, these would be very rare particles, so you need a lot of time to collect these events. But AMS is trying to answer all of that. Any questions on that? Uh, so I'd like, just like to kind of end up with AMS real quick. Uh, so you may have heard in the news last year, they did several EVAs uh, towards the end of last year, and I think one early this year. And basically what they did was they fixed the cooling system on the AMS. And so... Originally, that experiment was designed to last only three years. So from 2011, it lasted all the way up to 2018. So it went much past the life, its life expectancy. But now the coolant system's um, kind of new again, and, and, it, and it's, it's expected to go all the way to the end of station line. And so I'll also put here a link. Um, there's a series of podcasts done at the Johnson Space Center called Houston We Have a Podcast. And so they talk about a little bit about the science and some of the EVAs and what was done and some of the tools used. It's, a, it's actually pretty interesting. It's a very complex task. And episodes 117 through 119 talks about some of that. So uh, a lot more data is coming out. Um, some interesting things are being published now, but by 2024, we expect to uh, get a lot more information. So now I want to kind of focus on NICER. Um, so this is zoomed in again um, on the truss. And so this is the AMS right here. And then within this red circle is the nicer instrument. Uh, so hopefully this plays. Hopefully I have a uh, YouTube video playing right here. Um, it's just really a time lapse. But um, so you're looking down the edge of the truss. You can see the solar array in the background start rotating. But this white box right here is the nicer instrument. And so what you're seeing here is it's targeting, uh, uh, it's, it's an X-ray telescope, and I'm going to talk more about it, but it's targeting looking at different sources in the sky. And this is just a time lapse. Uh, so NICER is an acronym. It's, it's the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Um, yeah, hey, Brandon, question? Yeah. Brandon, there's a question that came in. Uh, what is the consensus about dark matter uh, exotic neutrino, and what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I, there is no consensus. Um, you know, there's some people that just think that the standard model is wrong, and, and, the, and it can't. There's nothing really about dark matter. So, for the, I would say the majority of sci uh, physicists, uh, particle physics, probably believe in. Uh, you know, this this. The standard model has been very successful. We found every particle all the way out to the Higgs. And so extent, there's various extensions of that beyond that to predict these uh, like neutralinos and axions and things called WIMPs, uh, weakly, inter, inter, weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. <laughs> 
so there's there's all very theoretical in nature and to be honest there you know it may just be that we can't detect them with our current technology but right now just like the higgs was for many years it, they're purely theoretical so it, it's really hard to say so i would say there's no consensus it is a big mystery and it's it's um the current state of research right now in this area is trying to find understand this uh, type of dark matter personally for me i I, you know, I, I think the theory kind of makes sense, but, you know, I don't have any data to back it up. You know, people have confidence when theories and formulas work out and it, and, but, but there are some problems in the theories, uh, but it's, it's really not an area that I work. So um, it's, you know, it's really just a subjective guess at this point. So I, I think there is evidence for dark matter based on astronomy. Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of different astronomical measurements that show there's something uh, out there. So I just don't know what type of particles they are. That's a good question though. <laughs> uh, I'll press on here with nicer. Uh, so yeah, it's a neutron interior composition explorer. It was launched 2017. Uh, basically, you know, it was, it was built to answer a lot of NASA and, and the National Academy of Sciences strategic questions, um, in, in the area of astrophysics, looking at ultra dense matter, uh, um, especially high mass situations like the collapse of neutron star, uh, of supermassive stars, and then of course black holes. And so the goal is really to look at the composition, all the processes, and all sorts of stuff in the star. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the um, some of the objectives because it's actually extended more than just neutron stars. Uh, it it's enabled a whole broad range of other astrophysics, including looking not only at black holes. But um, things called quasi-periodic oscillations, active galactic nuclei, and, and low and high mass X-ray binary systems. So uh, I showed this chart way back early on. Um, so the science objectives can really be broken down for NICER into the three broad areas, right? <clears throat> We're looking at the structure of neutron stars by um, uh, measuring uh, the, the radii and, and cooling sequences, testing those out against theory, studying the nature of the matter in the interior of the neutron stars by looking at and understanding the timing associated with pulsar outbursts, oscillations, and precession of these objects. And they study the energy output by looking at um, uh, the radiation press uh, patterns and spectra and the luminosities. And so, Earlier, when I was talking about the AMS, there's there's the hint that there could be another form of matter called strange matter. Well, neutron stars, we don't know what the core is. They could be containing uh, strange matter in the form of a quark star. Um, so instead of having confined neutrons compressed together, you may have free new, new uh, free quarks, so, uh, confined quarks to free quarks where some of those free quarks could be uh, strange rather than up or down. Um, there's some theories, uh, um, you know, looking back that these strange, strange quark stars could form through very intense supernova explosions or perhaps even um, shortly after the Big Bang events itself. So I think most uh, people in this area can't distinguish between um, uh, you know, from from the outside, a, a strange star might look just like a neutron star, but inside there's something totally different, and that's really what they're trying to investigate. So much work's uh, been accomplished with NICER, um, especially when it's combined with other uh, measurements from other systems like the Fermi satellite, Swift satellite, and even MAXI. Um, that's another instrument on space station. Um, and also with ground-based data. The kinds of discoveries obtained are, uh, you know, looking at the, looking at the neutron star radii and the light curve analysis, um, measuring masses and uh, testing uh, through millisecond pulsars, clock stabilities, um, pulsation periods, and uh, X-ray beam properties and stability of these beams. All sorts of things are coming out of this uh, system, this hardware. So real quick, uh, I just got one slide on the hardware for NICER, but it's um, it kind of looks like a square telescope. It's got 56 X-ray concentrators on it, and it's just basically think of an X-ray uh, telescope. 
Um, it's measuring a uh, light in a range from 0.2 to 12 keV kilo electron volts. So that's the X-ray range. Um, it has a bunch of them put together to have a large effective area of 600 square centimeters at 6 keV. Um, when you compare it, uh, it has two times the uh, timing capability and, uh, and energy resolution as uh, the Newton telescope in the soft X-ray regime. It's similar to uh, the X-ray hardware on Chandra uh, telescope uh, up in space satellite in XMM. Uh, that's the instrument. Uh, just has real precise timing and uh, basically better resolution than some of the instruments that are up there, depending on what you're looking at, anywhere from 25 up to 1,000 times uh, in timing resolution. When NICER is combined with a lot of the other instruments, it really is because of its precise timing capabilities. And more information uh, is, uh, again, on these links that I have on, the, on these charts here. So this is kind of an interesting uh, chart I wanted to show. Uh, so this is a map of the entire sky in x-rays, uh, as recorded by NICER. Uh, so as you saw in that video, you could see NICER kind of slews around and, and points at certain targets. And so, uh, you know, if you're looking, let's say, at nighttime uh, and collecting light in, in, of x-ray light only, this is kind of a map of what you'd see if you collected it over time. And what you see, um, you know, you see the brightness at each point on this page, on this image, is a result of the contributions of, this, of NICER just slewing and looking at those spaces. And as it's slewing, you get these arc, all these arcs. And so uh, um, the brighter it is means basically the more collection time that NICER has been putting on there. So you can see, uh, uh, like for instance, this uh, PSR J1874, this region right here is very bright here. So NICER has been observing that region for, for a lot of, it has a lot of time observing in that region. And which hey. also, oh. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Brandon. Uh, in, the, in the last chart, what is meant by non-imaging FOV? So, so FO, FO, FOV is field of view. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I don't think the full surface area is... Um, you, there's various energy ranges on here. And so some of the field of view, uh, like you can collect, you can still collect uh, outside of a certain, like there's a tolerance of five arc minutes diameter. And then outside of that um, for imaging outside of that, it's probably not used for the imaging. And so you still have part of the field of view, but it's probably not contained in the primary instrument um, uh, collection. I, yeah, we'd have to go to the website for sure to look, but that, I think that's what it's referring to. So in other words, the full surface area, um, it's not, it's not considered, you know, if you're imaging a particular part of the sky, there's a, a subset of that is really, when they're quoting these numbers, there's a subset of that is um, built into those numbers and outside of that, it, the, like near the edges, it's not quite as accurate. Hopefully that gives you at least an idea. Uh, yeah, so the last thing I was just gonna say on here, in general, there's this diffuse glow that it's present everywhere. Um, and that's just really the, the X-ray sky in general from all the sources from very far away, there's a diffuse glow of X-rays. Um, uh, so it's kind of interesting that it make, you can make a map like that. So some of the results of NICER. Well, so back last March, um, NICER actually made the cover of uh, Nature Magazine. And so here's an image here, and here's the title of the paper. Um, I think on the next chart, I have the link for this paper. Uh, so um, in this particular, uh, paper published. Uh, so, so Aaron Kara is one of the main PIs, principal investigators for for uh, NICER. 
Uh, she's at University of Maryland. Uh, and basically, she describes how NICER measured X-ray spectra of the stellar mass black hole, um, MAXI J1827, J1820. Um, that's just a number indicator. It was a black hole uh, first measured by MAXI. Um, but what they measured was there's something called the corona, and I'm going to talk about this on the next chart. Um, they actually think it shrunk from 100 miles to 10 miles, and they could detect X-rays um, uh, being shifted uh, through precise timing of NICER uh, to lead them to that conclusion. So, uh, so what I mean by that is, so I'm going to try to explain this, but I really encourage you to go to this link, this YouTube link, to see, hear the full explanation because there's a video that goes with this, and it's just too hard to show um, through this uh, particular setup we have. But so on the picture on the left is imagine you have a black hole right here in the center, this little black dot, and so around it you have this thing called the accretion disk. That's the orange orange region, and so um, what you have normally happening is there's charged particles, there's magnetic fields, and of course you got mass, a lot of mass in there, so you got gravitational forces and, and these magnetic forces. And so you get an instability happen. And what happens is uh, you know, things are like to flow towards the center, but they're also rotating. And so what happens is you have magnetic and gravitational forces, they can compress and heat the gas to millions of degrees in this orange disk. And all that energy has got to go somewhere, and it creates these two jets that pop out perpendicular um, off the poles, so to speak. And that's what the blue regions are. And so um, now these these particular uh, – this it's called the corona, not to be confused with the corona of the sun, but it's a gas, and it's much higher energy because it's a much hotter gas. And it can be up towards a billion degrees. And so when you're looking at light coming from these two different sources, because there are different temperatures, they're, they're shining at different frequencies. And so what they think is, so again, combining observational data with theoretical models, what they think what's happened is there was some kind of instability in the disk caused this rush of material to flow towards the black, the black hole, and it created a, a, an effect that, go to the next slide, uh, next part here, um, kind of propagates out into the corona, and for whatever reason, um, you, you're having X-rays. So they they know it's called reverberation. It's a technique they use to look at um, X-rays coming out of black holes. X-rays coming out of the corona can come down, and they can reabsorb and by the iron and potassium atoms that are in this uh, accretion disk, and then they get readmitted. And so what's happening is if if you see um, uh, so so if when it's shrinking, what you're seeing is because you're closer to the black hole, you have more gravitational effects than you do when you're further away. And so there's a there's a general relativistic effect from gravity that alters the frequency of these uh, these X rays that are bouncing off. You know, they're being absorbed and re-emitted, so effectively they're bouncing off, but because of the gravitational distortion, there's lag times built into that. And so if you see a change in the lag times and you know it's not something happening in the disk, then it has to be coming from the corona. And so they actually took data for over several weeks on this particular black hole, and they measured um, these time echoes getting closer together, which indicated that the corona was shrinking because they knew it wasn't coming from the disk. And so when they combine that with certain black hole models, they predict that, um, you know, on the order of a hundred mile cor shaped corona shrunk down about 10 miles, to 10 miles in extent. So um, with this, this is the first time anyone's ever observed something like this. So there needs to be a lot more uh, observations of this phenomena to, to really understand the process. But, um, it does match the theory and, and explains the data fairly well. Then a second result, I'm almost done here. Uh, uh, so again, pulsars, um, they're learning brand new things about pulsars that uh, 
just are blowing people's minds. You know, pulsars are neutron stars that rotate and emit radiation, and so they can appear as beacons. Uh, so if you look at the left lower box, uh, you know, the textbook model basically has, um, you know, a rotating body that's got a hot spot on, on opposite ends of the globe. And think of the beacon shooting out those two orange spots. And so as it rotates, it sweeps out a cone of, and if it's pointing towards Earth, we would see it in a regular pattern every so often. Um, so, but when you actually factor in the mass Okay, because pulsars are neutron stars, and they're very mass, a lot of mass combined into a very small area, like I said, about 10 miles or so. And one, of the, one of the objectives is to accurately measure uh, these radii. Um, so what people haven't been accounting for is near the edges of the, um, of the pulsar or the neutron star, because of the gravitational effects, the... the, the the warping of the light coming off it makes it appear larger than it, than it is. And so when you factor that in, um, plus the measurements that NICER did on Pulsar J0030, and that's published in this paper, uh, I have linked at the top, um, through precise timing, uh, so that this, pul this Pulsar is about 1,100 light years away. Um, they were able to measure fairly accurately, probably the most accurate mass of a pulsar ever made uh to 1.4 solar masses and a 16 mile diameter uh radius or a diameter of the pulsar but what was unique about this what they've discovered was that the hot spots aren't necessarily on opposite ends of each other in this particular case you had three hot spots on the bottom side of the pulsar and so this just completely destroys what knowledge and of these some of these simplified models and it tells us that we really need to try to learn and understand these pulsars a little bit better um they not they behave similar but they don't look what like what we're having so it tells us there's some physics that we're not really understanding and so this is opening up a whole bunch of new area of study with the uh, high mass stars and so uh i just threw in a couple titles here uh nicer's probably got 50 to 100 different papers published in the last two or three years. Um, it's just incredible, especially when it's combined with other data. Here's just some various titles here. Um, I'm not going to go through all these titles, but someone may ask, where can I find more of this information? So I really encourage you to go to the Space Station Research Explorer. Here's the link at the top of the page. Um, you can do search on um, keyword searches and bring up any information on any experiment. And then you can actually look by the type of uh, experiments, right? I've only been talking about AMS and NICER, but there's a lot of biological research, earth and sp earth science stuff, educational and even human research. So you can find anything on this webpage that's going on on station. You know, at, a, at any given moment, there's several hundred experiments going on the space station. And then finally, uh, more information on, on social media, space station research uh, is real prominent. Um, here's the actual website that uh, takes you to the Research Explorer to show you on the last page. Um, they're on Twitter. There's even an app for your phone. It works uh, both on the Android and iPhone. You can do a search for Space Station Research Explorer. And then um, if you want to get connected through uh, um, through email, go to this uh, website down here, uh, and that'll take you to so we can sign up and get uh, email uh, inputs when there's new articles and, and stuff coming out. And I think, yeah, I think I'll just end there. So that's that's what I'd like to end it at. So thank you for your time, and uh, I'm not sure, Trevor, if you guys got any more questions, but I'm happy to answer them. I haven't seen any come in. Uh, so we'll go ahead and pass on to Doug. Okay. So Brandon, thank you very much for that talk. That was very interesting. And thank you for all the good work you put into bringing that to us tonight. And also I wanted to mention that we will be leaving a recording of this meeting on YouTube. Uh, Brandon had a lot of good links on there. So if you'd like to go later and reference those links, there'll be a recording there that you can go back and review his presentation. Next up, we have David 
Pavlin with Star Party News. I'd like to pass it over to David. Okay, hear me, Trevor? You're good to go. All right. This will be an interesting one with all the fun we've had. Uh, there's a calendar, past events. I'll talk about uh, Venus and volcanism at the LPI on the 22nd, or San Leon on uh, Thursday, March 5th. And we had what turned out so far to be our last events of March 6th at the Hack Winery. As we know, Fort McCavitt is the next uh, uh, Earth Day at the LPI and the Hack Winery have all ended up being canceled. Sliding in to the future, we know TSP is canceled, although they're trying to do something. What are they? Um, you guys can chime in on the chat. It's something like the West Texas Star Party. They're trying to get a little, little thing going out there at the Prude Ranch. Um, this has caused quite a bit of consternation for us, and I'm not just saying for JSCAS. FBAC, HAS, I'm sure NHAC is having its share of uh, angst as well as Aaron at the uh, Insperity Observatory. Our problem is until social distancing is formally lifted, um, we're kind of stuck. Discussions with the other two libraries in Nassau City were on hold. Um, uh, I've had discussions with uh, Sherelle at the LPI. They're pretty much on hold. They're doing things virtually as are we right now. But if things go ahead, keep, you know, move, move forward in progress, we tentatively have Hack on the 26th, asteroid uh, day in planetary defense, the LPI on the 27th, another event on the July 18th. Hack again, International Observe the Moon Night at the LPI. And this is even in doubt. October 23rd, all clubs, we have an all clubs speaker. Uh, it's going to be Louise Proctor right there of the LPI. But we're still going to proceed as though A Day is going to happen at the George Observatory. Um, I don't know if I want to address the George yet, but uh, a note just came out from the uh, HMNS. Um, HMNS downtown is going to be opening, hopefully, within a month or so. After that has to be Sugarland and then the George, and there's no real timetable for this at the moment. So I'm going to leave that there. I will come up and say that on a brighter side, Posted on the website not two minutes before we started this, Paul Maley sent two uh, two uh, two links, two YouTube links. Uh, one from the Iranian Space Agency. They were successful in launching a satellite, and oh, I didn't want to do that. And uh, there's a YouTube link for that, but it's about three and a half minutes long and fairly repetitive. Uh, however, Paul was able, after a number of attempts, to make his own video from the border of Mexico and. Uh, uh, Arizona. And I'm going to try it because I had it up before the meeting. And let's see if it'll take me there. I want to go to this one. And it's 14 seconds long. And when it gets to the about, I'd say at about 12 seconds, you're going to see this little guy zip right across. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Hopefully this will work. And hopefully you're going to see it. And there he goes, right up there. Okay, <laughs> it's gonna go back to shut you up and go back to the presentation. Um, if you want to look at them again, I have posted both these YouTube links links on the uh, on the website on the front page. Okay, on Saturday, February twenty second, they had the Venus and Volcanism event at the LPI. Um, about 100 people were there, Bob and Leslie Eaton, Chris, Chris, Doug, Holland, uh, Doug, um, Jerry, I hung, uh, Leonard Ferguson showed up, Trevor and uh, Connie and David, and here's Doug, and I think there's Doug again, and I think Bob and Leslie Eaton are out there in the back. Here's Bob again, Leslie working her binox, here's Bay and Jerry. Um, <laughs> Bob again fighting with that mule on. That was always always a fun one. Picture of Leonard, Trevor, and then uh, Chris's beautiful Mac. Okay, and on Thursday, March fifth, we had a I think the final event so far at uh, San Leon. Bob and Leslie were there. Kayla LaFrance and Dan and Rebbie Roy were there. I think it was three scopes and a pair of binoculars. 
as I understand it, there are about 30 to 40 in attendance. And the following night, we had March 6th at the Hack. Bob and Leslie, Chris, both Chris's, Trevor um, and Connie, Mark DeCellis, haven't seen him for a bit, Jerry Campbell, by Hung, 10 people with eight scopes and one pair of binoculars. We had about 150 people total in attendance. Chris brought his uh, big light bucket. Other Chris had his interesting little refractor. Doug was always the brunt of jokes because he brought his old uh, entourage of people down here. Uh, Mark hadn't seen him for a bit and Trevor being a character. Bob Eaton futzing with something. We handed out a few flyers. Chris was taking a peek at things over here and just basic winery pictures as we go. Oh, it was all a good time to have. Little did we know at that time that was gonna be it. For 2019, we had an amazing number of events, 17, which is quite a, quite a few for us, and that was good, even though three of them were on the same day. So in reality, we had 15 total events, and that's really good for us. That's summated to about 424 hours total, 19 volunteers, ranging from one to uh, 13 events. Uh, Trevor stole the show here at 13, and you can run your eye down here with the number of events attended. This did get us NSN pins. Um, NSN called it for for five events, so did we. So right here at five events, I don't know when we're gonna be able to give the pins out. Right now it would be six foot pin toss, but next time we might be able to assemble, I can try to hand off some of the, hand off some of the pins that we, uh, that we earned. And outreach, whether it's at the George, observe, uh, LPI or anywhere else, since the eyepiece is touched, from a biological point of view, this is rough. This makes it a point of an infection. Um, cleaning and sterilization is problematic. I know I put this in a note. All the clubs are dealing with this. Um, we're trying to figure out ways of well, those of us with cameras, could we do a, a night of you know, star hopping and this and that, and then it comes down to what can you show? I mean, I, me and anybody in the club with a camera could do a, a tour of the moon, but that's one shot deal. Um, Trevor had this interesting YouTube he threw in my direction. This is a gent doing this, doing kind of what we're talking about at the McDonald Observatory, but I will tell you part of this was staged. Uh, he had some very nice face on, uh, full frame, full field of view, um, uh, face on galaxies. So there's probably a little bit of, I say staging in there. Uh, he is in dark skies. He was able to show some things live through the, uh, through the scope that may not work too well for those of us in uh, the urban areas. So we're open to suggestions. I mean, as I said, HAS I know is dealing with this and uh, FBAC is certainly bantering it about. And what are we gonna do once we can actually start to go to locations? We're gonna have to maintain social distancing, but then we've got eyepieces to contend with. So outside of that, that's how you stay safe from the coronavirus. That's all. All right, back to you, Doug. Thank you. And thank you, David, for that presentation. And thank you for being our Star Party Chairman. Next up, we have a do-it-yourself astronomy rigging it for a remote interview with Chris Wells and Trevor Quinn. All right, good evening. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, th this is based on a couple of presentations that were presented to the club previously. So uh, we took those ideas and we're trying to see how far we can take it. Uh, so the idea uh, that we are doing is to um, uh, run and, and remotely control the telescopes uh, initially from inside the house to outside um, and uh, so in this in this diagram, what we've got is uh, a couple of uh, small computing devices. Uh, I'm using a Raspberry Pi uh, running Ubuntu uh, with uh, an indie server on it. Uh, and then up above we have, uh, which is connected to a scope, and then we have a uh, Intel NUC also running Ubuntu with the Indy drivers connected to another scope. Those are both hardwired into a wireless router. And then we're connecting with our 
laptops to the wireless remote wireless router to remotely control uh, those indie servers to control the uh, movements and uh, camera and any other thing that we can throw at it uh, from a remote uh, point. Uh, Chris, oh. go ahead. Yep. Okay. So, um, so basically, we've got two rigs. Um, this is the big rig. This is my um, my C11 uh, HD. Uh, I've only had it actually since about August or September last year. Um, I've got it. Um, I've got it set up indoors here, and uh, you can see um, you see a big wire down at the bottom here. That big LAN wire was actually connected to the router that uh, Trevor showed in the prior diagram. Um, I've got a number of um, number of things here. I'm operating it with a Hyperstar at f2. So the camera, when I have it set up properly outside, is actually up at the front there. So I can get to a super fast F2 um, um, imaging uh, platform. I'm using an Attic uh, 460EX as a CCD camera, one of the cold varieties. I'm using a Lodestar Auto Guider and a MicroTouch Focuser. Um, I'm going to zoom in on a little bit area here. The NUC is at the bottom. That's actually uh, running the Ubuntu um, operating system. And I'm actually put all my power supplies and everything in one in one case to make it easier. As I scroll up, you start to see some of the other um, things that I've set up here. I've actually done some what I call underbelly wiring, underbelly um, mounting of some of the focus controller and the actual USB hub up there too. And it, that actually minimizes the number of wires. So really the whole control of everything in the mount is really done through this one wire. And uh, that's how it's all controlled. But the brains of this is really down at the bottom here. The brains of this is that uh, next unit computing Ubuntu, um, Ubuntu based computer that we're gonna run different um, software on. Let's go to the second rig. Okay, before I get started, um, the question came in about uh, does the system use the local Wi-Fi or can it be run without local Wi-Fi capability? Uh, in, in this case, uh, we're, we're, we've, we will bring a Wi-Fi router with us to run wherever we are in the field. Um, so it, it, we haven't figured out the ad hoc version of the Wi-Fi yet to where we don't need a router in the middle. Uh, but uh, maybe eventually we can get to that point. Uh, so going on to describe my rig, um, again, this is set up at Chris's house, uh, and this is our preliminary testing where we're just seeing if we could get the mounts to move. Uh, Chris, can you back up again? Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and point the scopes and uh, if we could actually snap images with it. Uh, even though, you know, it's just going to be some light blur, but uh, at least we we're getting something. Uh, so in this situation, I've got uh, an uh, William Optics Red Cat 51 scope uh, with the imaging camera being a Nikon D53 DSLR. Uh, I have a <coughs> ZWO um, 30 millimeter guide scope. And I'm attempting to use my Celestron uh, Next Image 10 planetary camera as an auto guide camera. We'll see how that turns out. <laughs> uh, we're still <laughs> testing it. Uh, then uh, down on the tray of the mount, uh, the tripod is the Raspberry Pi unit. Uh, it's connected to the Wi-Fi router. Uh, and then from there, we have our laptops that are connected. And I think we'll show Chris's first. Okay, yeah, so this is probably the least exciting slide. This is a laptop. This is what we're going to control all the equipment with that we've seen in the previous slides. 
Uh, this, of course, is my laptop, uh, and it, it, and both of them together, uh, and they they are running the uh, KSTARS uh, application uh, with an Ecos um, connection back to the the NUT and then the Raspberry Pi. And Chris will show you his stuff. So um, so obviously this was kind of all setting it set it up indoors, which is a great way to start because. Um, you know, you can see there's a lot of wiring, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of software, so, do, do this with software, do that with software. Um, but I actually had a chance to use it um, for the first light um, session uh, where I had all the equipment outside um, that I showed you in the big rig setup and started to use the KSTARS ECOS application. Um, on my um, small Surface laptop to take my very first image. So this is actually my very first ever remote image that I've taken from the comfort of the indoor environment, having a nice drink, sitting and watching the image. So this is the, the image as it's being formed. And this is really the control panel within KSTARS that shows you what's happening. I was gonna take 40 um, images in total it was at number eight while it was taking it um each of the images was, was actually at three minutes so three uh minutes in total and it was auto guiding as well so that was actually my first use of it and you can see that's one image out of the f2 fast optics that i'm actually taking you can see it's very characteristic of the hyperstar lens you can see a lot of vignetting that occurs around the edges of that uh, of that picture but here it is in operation working while it was taking image number eight of image 40. here is the um the other tab within k stars actually has an integral um auto guiding uh program um it, apparently it works with phd2 2 as well although i didn't get that part working so i just used the integrated software that was in it and um, let me zoom in a little bit on the area so that anybody who's um, auto-guided before uh, will appreciate that this is the kind of thing that you're really looking to achieve here, um, which is a scatter diagram of the mount errors. And as long as you're in that green circle, you're within plus and minus um, one arc seconds, which is really what you're trying to aim, aim, aim for. And you can see the various corrections in right of ascension and declination that are occurring. And here are the magic numbers. So, you know, when you've been imaging for, um, for, for you know, an hour or so, um, you really start to get a good idea of your mount's accuracy. And if you can be under one arc second, you're doing pretty well. So I'm really, really pleased on how this was operating. And I can actually see these numbers without being outside at all. So I didn't need to go outside in any way. So that's, uh, that's, that was a really encouraging uh, view. This is the view here, actually. You can actually see in the Lodestar Auto Guider camera. This is only a 50 millimeter lens, um, but it's actually showing you the, uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy there that's being, um, that's being um, imaged. But what it's really doing is just taking continuous pictures of that one star there and looking for movement in that star to actually do auto guiding by. way okay so this last picture here is um is kind of a goofy picture of me getting a little bit excited this was the day after when i started to process the images that i was doing the night before and this is the whirlpool galaxy picture on my screen after uh processing it it was 40 images each were three minute subs uh, you know using the c11 optics at f2 which is why i got so much detail out of that picture but this was, as I say, the first remote picture that was done uh, that I did using the setup that um, really was pioneered by, um, by, by those before us, uh, Brad Thomas's presentation, Doug Holland's presentation, and uh, the technical expertise there of Trevor who helped me put all this together to make it work. So really, really encouraged that I could do that remotely from indoors. Um, here are the things that I proved out and got working using the KSTARS application. I got the go-to, so I did actually go to M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and it was in the center of field of view. So I was really, really happy about that. I actually got the auto-focusing working 
the autofocusing of the MicroTouch um, Starizona software that actually um, controlled the focuser. So I actually did some autofocusing. That turned out really well as well. Auto guiding, I told you a little bit about auto guiding and uh, showed you some uh, really nice numbers there. 0.91 arc seconds um, RMS. So re really pleased about that. And also the image capture as well. Um, so that was me taking 40 images. Um, but the software suite itself does a lot, lot more. And I'm looking forward to trying more of what the software does. Um, it does special things called plate solving. Haven't done it yet, but looking forward to trying. Has a lot of planning capability and sequence generation as well. And it's really designed for complete remote observatory viewing. And this would be our ultimate goal with this, where we would have some remote observatory somewhere, presumably out in West Texas, uh, where the, the little uh, uh, Raspberry Pi or NUC would be with its scope uh, connected back to the internet. And then we would be home in our Clear Lake area, remotely imaging. Uh, from the comfort of home. Um, we'll see where we end up with that. Uh, and at this point, we're gonna pass it back to Doug. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. And yes, I can testify that uh, working with the Raspberry Pis has been quite an adventure. So I'm glad that other people in the club are doing that and congratulate the great success that Chris and Trevor has had on that. I think they've uh, taken it quite a bit farther than I have so far, but it's, uh, it's really a blast doing that. Thank you for that presentation. Next, we have Jerry Campbell will be telling us about recollections of James Peebles, 2019 Nobel Laureate in Physics for Advances in Physical Cosmology. I pass it to Jerry now. Okay, good evening. Uh, first, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I really had no idea how well Brandon's uh, talk would kind of give you an overview of uh, the major questions in cosmology, uh, which is what the gentleman I, I'm going to be talking about really had a great deal to do with over the past more than half century. Second, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, uh, the, the choice of the title Recollections may be a little um, um, unfortunate because Dr. Peebles is not dead. He's still alive and very active. Uh, the reason for that term Recollections is that I had a little bit of a connection with him uh, long ago as a graduate student. And this just uh, shows a picture from a, a summer school in uh, relativity and astrophysics that I was fortunate enough to be able to attend as a graduate student in 1972 in a place called Banff, Alberta, which is a really nice resort uh, town. And you can see Dr. Peebles uh, in the middle here, uh, quite a bit younger than what the picture you'll see in a minute with his wife. Uh, and you can see that I really did attend this. There, there I am from University of Texas, Austin. Uh, there were three or four of us from UT Austin that were able to go. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about his place in all of this. <clears throat> um, many of you probably have heard of Robert Dickey at Princeton. Uh, he's uh, uh, famous for the Brands Dickey theory. The Brands Dickey theory is an alternative uh, theory of, um, of gravitation in which there's a, an additional scalar field which uses a cosmologic constant that you can set. Uh, and he also had a lot of uh, experimental uh, work uh, that he, he did. Um, he was one of a number of physicists who were involved in the radar development during the Second World War. And <clears throat> he developed a, a microwave um, sensor or antenna called the Dickey radiometer. So uh, James Peebles was his uh, graduate student at Princeton. <clears throat> And uh, you can see some of his data there. He is Canadian. Uh, he got his PhD in 1962. He's now Albert Einstein Professor of Science at Princeton University. Uh, <clears throat> when he was working with uh, Dickey at, in those days in the 60s, um, Dickey uh, was using this radiometer to try to, de to detect 
the cosmic microwave background. And that had been predicted since about the 40s and people had uh, kind of guessed at its uh, uh, energy. Uh, the, 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 m- most of the early estimates were too high. Um, and, and Peebles actually helped really um, set up the, the mathematical basis for, for this cosmic microwave background. And so, so Dickey was uh, up on the roof of a building in Princeton with his team and his radiometer, and they were uh, actively trying to detect this radiation. But then a couple of guys who were also using a Dickey radiometer they built at Bell Labs named uh, Penzias and Wilson uh, found it first. And Dickey was known to say to his team, boys, we've been scooped. Um, so those were um, sort of the story of how the cosmic microwave background radiation was first detected. Uh, this is a family tree of sorts you see here. Um, uh, you see a couple of uh, people's students, uh, Stuart Shapiro and Margaret Geller. These are both fairly well-known astrophysicists. <clears throat> and um, to uh, look at, at um, the relationship between physicists in this way is kind of a useful thing because you kind of get an idea of who's influencing who and also who has a major influence in the field. And the next slide I'm gonna show you, you probably won't be able to read, but this comes from something called the physics tree that you can find online. And it basically has these relationships. So, so the lines are drawn between people on the top who supervised people uh, in, in the next uh, level. And you can see the, the line going to Peebles there with uh, Robert Dickey. And uh, then under Peebles, you can see uh, his students. And there are, uh, I think, six of those listed. Um, and then if you look at their students, uh, who are all now practicing uh, uh, physicists, you can, I think I count about 36 of them. So you really can see the impact that Peebles had on this field of uh, cosmology and astrophysics. <clears throat> so let me just summarize here what the Nobel Committee had to say. Uh, and they really highlight his insights into physical cosmology and the uh, theoretical framework that he developed beginning in the 60s. And, and they, it's their opinion that that's the basis of our contemporary ideas about the universe. So why is that? So you heard from Brandon about the uh, period of time in which photons uh, became uh, uh, active and can, could escape and move around <clears throat> um, a little before 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And eventually produce this uh, background radiation. Um, And he was uh, able to uh, really utilize uh, the information about this background radiation theoretically to predict and discover new processes. And one of those things, and you heard from Brandon about dark matter and dark energy, uh, really is uh, the result of uh, his and, of course, many other uh, theoretical work, the, the fact that we uh, we know that that something like this must exist, and we need to look for it. So this slide just summarizes his contributions to physical cosmology. So number one, he made major contributions to supporting the idea of the Big Bang model of the universe, really beginning in the 1960s. So again, this is more than half a century of work. Uh, Some of his major work had to do with nucleosynthesis that happened during the Big Bang. And I think you heard that these are light elements. Uh, The heavier elements are are, uh, formed in stellar nucleosynthesis. Uh, And also really the prediction that there should be dark matter and dark energy. Uh, I mentioned the Brands-Dickey theory early on. And the Brands-Dickey theory is one that has a cosmological constant. And really this can be set in such a way that it is basically equivalent to to what we are now calling dark energy. Uh, <clears throat> he was very actively involved in the theoretical pre- prediction of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and uh, 
worked on cosmic structure formation and the predictor, and, and prediction of fluctuations in the, in the uh, cosmic microwave background starting in the 1980s. And as you probably have some idea, uh, people have just really started to make major observations of the anisotropies and uh, uh, variations in this background and what they mean. <clears throat> so uh, he really is credited for giving the field of physical cosmology, a mathematical basis, and really putting it into uh, uh, scientific respectability. So just to end, I wanted to show you some of his publications, which some of some of the titles here really reflect that. So cosmic black body radiation, that, that basically is how you get the, the radiation in the first place that cools from somewhere in the vicinity of 3000 degrees Kelvin at the time of uh, transparency to less than three degrees Kelvin now. Uh, large scale structure of the universe. This is a book. Uh, cosmology with time variable cosmological constant. So again, this is getting into the idea of dark energy and cosmological constant and dark energy. I also uh, want to mention that uh, I did find uh, this textbook uh, available online fairly inexpensively, and it's actually a quite, a, quite a nice read. Uh, I can't say I've read all of it, but uh, it is very heavily uh, into the mathematics, but you can actually read around the mathematics and get a lot of useful uh, information about physical cosmology. So that is kind of my uh, uh, findings of James Peebles, I had not really been following him closely over the years, and I wanted to really go back and see uh, what what he had done that made his uh, him him uh, so visible to the Nobel Committee. And thank you very much for your uh, for your interest. That's it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jerry. And um, next, okay, I have a do-it-yourself astronomy, do-it-yourself astronomical spectroscopy discussion. Oh, so, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do, a lot of fun and interesting things we can do as amateur astronomers. And I have a long list of things that I would like to do in amateur astronomy. One of those things that I've been wanting to do for a long time is to doing, uh, see if I, how I can do spectroscopy. So what can be accomplished with spectroscopy? Um, you can do stellar spectra, you can do planetary nebula, you can do emission nebula, and others. And these are not my spectrums here, but these are some examples of things that can be accomplished as an amateur. So first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to spread the light into a spectrum. So for all you Pink Floyd and Isaac Newton fans, you could use a prism, as I show over here on the left-hand side, which takes the light in and uses refraction to spread the light into its spectrum. Another way to do it is you can use a diffraction gradient, which uses diffraction instead of refraction. Uh, diffraction gradient is a device that has a bunch of lines that are closely spaced, like this one here has a thousand lines per millimeter, and choose a diffraction that will spread light into a spectrum also. So spectroscopy that you can do. There's a company called RSpec, and if you follow the astronomy magazines like Astronomy Technology Today, which is I think my favorite one, or Sky and Telescope, you may have seen an ad for this company, RSpec. They make uh, hardware and software that allows you to do spectroscopy yourself. So the way I did it, and I'm gonna show you um, a way you can do it too, they take a diffraction grain and they put it into a one and a quarter inch uh, filter holder like this, cost about $195. It's called a Star Analyzer 100 grading, which means it has 100 lines per millimeter. And they also sell adapters that will let you take that diffraction grading and adapt it to your camera. So they have this adapter that you can take the diffraction grading, put it into this holder, and then it will adapt it to a T-thread so that you can put it on your camera. It's like a DSLR's T-thread. And then it sets the spacing to the right spacing to get this to work right, which winds up being approximately 70 millimeters from the DSLR. Next, you're gonna to have to select a telescope to use for your doing spectroscopy. The first thing you have to consider is your telescope has to be able to pass the spectrum that you want to see. Um, it turns out that um, 
aluminum coatings are broadband coatings. They, they pass visible light and ultraviolet light and near infrared and do a good job at it. They don't reflect as, as high as some other coatings, but um, they are broadband. There are some dielectric mirrors on the other hand that actually do not pass uh, all those uh, wavelengths that you may want to see with your spectrometer. They do very well for visible light, but there are issues with some uh, dielectric mirrors when you want to go out into the near infrared. So I just pick your telescope and then you're going to want to find out, well, is my telescope going to even work? Now, our spec on our web page has a nice calculator that helps you uh, determine whether or not your telescope is going to work. And actually, the telescope I originally was going to use did not did not work for this. So what you do is you put in your telescope information, you put in your aperture, your uh, focal ratio, what you think the scene is going to be in your area for that evening your grading to sensor distance, your pixel size, and how many um, pixels there are horizontally on your camera. And if you get three green bars, this OK, OK, and OK, that means that you have selected a good uh, telescope and camera combination that will allow you to do spectroscopy. So this is the input up here, and then the output gives you things like amps, angstroms per pixel, and angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th meters, a lot of times, you know, at least I think more in nanometers, which is 10 to the minus ninth meters. So 10 to the minus 10th meters is angstrom is, there's 10 angstroms in one nanometer. And you also are interested in what your uh, full width half max is going to be of your star image. If this gets to be too small, your, your star will be dim. If it's too big, your resolution will be too low. So you plug in these values, you figure out if your spacing's good, if your telescope's good, and then once you get it all put together, you have to be able to focus your system. <clears throat> but this one thing to think about is the star image is actually going to focus at a different point than is the spectrum. So the star image comes down here and it focuses right here in the middle. And what to get close, what you do is you originally focus on the star. And then after once your star is focused, which is easy to do mostly with a batten off mask, is a very good way to uh, focus on a star. And once you're on the star, you're going to be close to where your spectrum is, is going to be focused. So originally I get my star focus and then I can adjust my focus a little bit to make my spectrum as sharp as I possibly can get it. So here's my first attempt at doing uh, spectroscopy. This is what the, the DSLR setup I just showed you. And this is actually the star Sirius, which is a good star, which I'll explain in a minute for taking your first spectrum. So here's the star and here's the spectrum it produces uh, in the, you know, in the color part, version of the spectrum. And this is a light, uh, or this is a line curve that shows you the spectrum. Now, in addition to producing the hardware that I just showed you, our spec also makes this software package, which is very nice, costs $109, 30-day free trial, and that's $109 after that. And this is, uh, this is the same spectrum, but now I've calibrated it. What you do is you go into the calibration procedure, which is, is done by clicking on this button right here, and you select where your star is, which they call the zero order uh, image. And then you're going to select on where the hydrogen beta line is in, in your spectrum. And by using that, it's going to calibrate how many angstroms there are per pixel, which in this case was 9.1. Now, once I've got this calibrated, then I can go over here and I can select different uh, elements and different uh, molecules and I can see these lines that we would expect for these different elements. For example, in this case, I'm, I select the hydrogen bomber lines, which are the hydrogen lines that are uh, that you can see in the visible light range. And these are hydrogen bomber lines and it. My hydrogen bomber line, my hydrogen beta line actually lines up very well with that, which is what I calibrate to, but I'm also seeing a dip down here in my hydrogen alpha line. So when I was doing this very first time, I actually only had about 20 minutes of doing this before the clouds rolled in. And uh, I was able to get a spectrum and it was kind of cool, but uh, I wanted to try it again, which I'll show you my second attempt in a minute, which worked much better. I also should say that when I was doing this, I originally was thinking, okay, I'm trying to take a spectrum, so I should use a color camera because spectrums are color and I should use a color camera to get spectrums. Well, that is, that's incorrect. Uh, what you really, you get a lot better results using a monochrome camera that is not uh, wavelength limited as the color camera is, which I'll show in a minute. But uh, you may think, you know, use a DSLR, use a color camera, and that's a bad idea. You want to use a monochrome camera that has this wide 
of a bandwidth as you possibly can get. So here's my second attempt. My second attempt, instead of using a DSLR, use the same SA100 diffraction grain on monochrome uh, CCD camera. Got the spacing as close as I get to about 70 millimeters. Use some uh, T adapters to get this in here. Use the same telescope in the end. Put all these numbers into the calculator. Same specs for the telescope, but different for the um, camera. I had different, slightly different grading to sensor distance of 73 millimeters. Pixel size was different, I believe. Different number of pixels, but I still got three green bars. And so that means I was good to go on this. In case I had 7.4 angstroms per pixel, pretty good resolution. And my star image size was 4.4 pixels full width half max. So that's all okay. Now, when you're using this, um, there's a couple of features I want to tell you about this, this is zoom and rotate. So once I put, this is my monochrome version. Once I put my star up here, you can zoom in to see your actual spectrum. And you can see these absorption lines here, these dark lines are actually the uh, spectral lines I'm looking for. I can zoom in, look at this. The other thing is you're gonna have to rotate this. You, you take the star analyzer 100 fraction gray and you have to get it so that your, your star is over here on the left and your spectrum is over on the right hand side, but they have to be basically perfectly horizontal for this to work well. And uh, you can, as you can imagine, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to get that, that star analyzer diffraction grain positioned perfectly in, in your camera so it's exactly horizontal. And they, have, they do have a little mark on the side of the star analyzer that, that tells you, you know, roughly where, you know, the orientation of it. But what really happens is once you get this in here, you use the rotate function to rotate it so it's perfectly horizontal. So in my case, I had to rotate it to 357 degrees, which isn't too bad, which means I was only off by about three degrees from actually being horizontal. And then this is the spectrum that I, that I got from this, and I'll show you more of that in a second. Now, before we look at the actual spectrum, I wanted to say what my objective was here. So the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to see if I could measure some star spectra and try to figure out what the different types of stars were. So um, most of you or some of you are probably familiar with the HR diagram, which is a diagram that, that plots stellar temperature, surface temperature versus luminosity. So it's cold, cooler on the, on the right hand side where it's just red and it's actually hotter when you go towards the blue where it's temperature and luminosity increases as you go up. There's a spectral type we have split up into O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And I'm not gonna try to explain those letters because who knows why they put them in that order, I don't. Um, o, B, o, B, A, F, G, K, M. And then within each one of these, they're also split up into 10 different uh, gradations. So example for the A, you have A, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You have F, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. So you could look at these stars and you could say, well, okay, the red ones are pi and M and the blue ones are pi and O or B or something like that. And you look at this and you could, you could get a, kind of a rough idea what the different spectral types are just by trying to guess what their colors are. But there's a much more uh, accurate way to do that. It turns out that the different spectral types of stars have different um, absorption lines that are more prominent in the different types. For example, an A0 star has very prominent hydrogen bomber lines. So I look at this A uh, star here, and these, these here are the hydrogen lines, and you can see that they're very prominent in the spectra. On the other hand, an M spectral type star has very strong titanium oxide lines. So let's see, if I find my M star in my titanium oxide, and these lines are much stronger. So as an amateur, playing around with this, I'm trying to think, well, I'd like to be able to look at this and be able to see if I can classify these stars myself. And this is what my goal is to see if I can, uh, you know, figure out which ones are A stars and whatever, which ones are M stars or other classifications. And here are uh, my stellar spectra that I took. This uh, one on the left is Specta, which is an A0 star. It turns out that star is uh, one in the, in, the, in the cup of the Big Dipper. And this is an A0 star, so it's supposed to have very strong hydrogen bomber lines. And as you can see, uh, my hydrogen lines are pretty good. These are the ones I selected hydrogen bomber, and they just about 
hit right on my dips here. I got good absorption lines for all my good my hydrogen bomber lines. So that's a good verification that I can see this and uh, see these hydrogen bom bomber lines. And that's what I would expect for an A0 star. This other one here, this is Yed Pryor, which is an M1 star, and that's in Ophiuchus. In this case, I'm expecting to see my titanium oxide lines to be strong. So you click on titanium oxide and you can see that there they are. They actually are just about hitting where they're supposed to be for the different absorption dips. Now you may look at this, you may think, well, wait a minute. Um, uh, you know, what? how does the, uh, the quantum efficiency curve, how does the spectral response of the uh, camera affect this? And I did not, con uh, did not compensate for the quantum efficiency curve. Here's the QE curve for my particular sensor. Uh, and this will affect it, and you could you could um, you could calibrate for that, and actually actually probably get a more accurate results by calibrating for your QE curve. But another thing to look at on this, which I found very interesting, was um, uh, stars considered to be well, they have absorption lines, but they also are considered to be a black body radiator at some point. And so you can look at this, and you can see well, okay, we, from black body radiation. A black body radiator, as it gets hotter, is going to get more towards the blue. And this this curve here does it, it is peaking more towards the blue. So as a black body radiator, I'm confirming that there it is actually going is going more towards the blue. On the other hand, a cooler star, the black body radiator should be shifted more towards the red. And in this case, by golly, look at that! It actually is shifted more towards the red. So not only can you, you know, as an amateur, you can you can uh, measure these different lines, these spectral lines, and find out what your uh, stars are actually made of. Uh, you can also confirm black body radiation uh, from these different cooler and hotter stars, which is what this demonstrates. Okay, so in addition to doing stars, I was interested in also getting some spectra from uh, nebulae, and so I the first one I did was a uh, the ring nebula M57 in Lyra. And I thought this was kind of cool. Okay, so when you take the image here, this is the original, okay, this, this is the image that it produces. So the original image, here's the ring nebula, and then it creates two more images over here. It's this original image, and there's actually a brighter image here, and then there's another one here. And it turns out that these images, after you calibrate the system, you know, on a star, wind up being exactly right where they're supposed to be for oxygen three and for hydrogen alpha. So this is the uh, original image, this is the oxygen three image, and this is the hydrogen alpha image. And it turns out that these planetary nebulas, at least from what I'm seeing, are actually hotter or more, have more luminosity in, in oxygen than they do in hydrogen. That's the ring nebula. And I also did the uh, NGC 6826, the blinking planetary nebula, which is in the Sigma, I think. I think that's right. And here's the original image over here. Here's the uh, original, and then here's the, the oxygen three and the hydrogen alpha image of this planetary nebula. And here it is with my calibrated system. So I just wanna make sure it's clear that once you calibrate the system using a A0 or A type A star, you then have your angstroms per pixel, which is shown up here, and your angstroms per pixel. So I can put any other celestial object in there now, like a planetary nebula or whatever, once this thing's calibrated, then I can uh, see the spectrum of these other, these other celestial objects, like planetary nebulae. Okay, now another topic that's similar but different. Uh, another thing that I found kind of fun to do recently, there's a gadget you can get which is called a Project Star Spectrometer, it costs about $36. And this is kind of cool. You can take these devices outside and you can uh, let the sunlight, has a little slit on the side of it, and the sunlight can come in here and you can see the absorption lines from the sun with one of these devices. You can look at it, it's got a, a graticule and you can read off what the different wavelengths are of the absorption lines of the sun. And you can look on the top of this device and it tells you the different wavelengths of light and what elements that these uh, wavelengths correspond to. And this works surprisingly well. I took this out and I've had I've shared this with some other family members and everybody was able to do it. And it's kind of fun because you can look at this and see uh, what elements there are in the sun and, and view it for yourself. 
So the purpose of my presentation is to show uh, something else we can do in amateur astronomy. It's uh, I've been doing a lot of astrophotography, which is really a blast, and this is uh, this is fun too. Something new I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I invite uh, the rest of you to uh, try this sometime too if you're interested in it. And that is the end of that. Okay, I have not heard any questions, so I assume you're just all uh, uh, Doug. Yes. Okay, so we've got uh, a general question that came in yesterday. Okay. Um, and then there's a question for Brandon and then another question uh, for Jerry. So uh, <laughs> okay. I'll go ahead I'll go ahead and start with uh, with the general question for you, Doug. Yes, let me take the general one. All right. Uh, the, qu the this is a multi-part uh, so it, it says, what viewing would you recommend for beginning astronomers with entry-level equipment after reasonably good viewing of the moon and the five brightest planets? What are the next objects to view? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, now, I recognize that a lot of people think, oh, I have terrible light pollution. I can't do astronomy. You know, it's terrible. Well, you know what? Uh, where I live, there's a street light out in front of my house, and I live in what's considered a gray zone, if you look on the clear sky clock. So it's, right, we have terrible light pollution here. But there are things that you can see. I mean, I can, from my backyard, like I took, I just showed you a picture of the ring nebula. I can see the ring nebula from my backyard. I wouldn't necessarily that's say it's the next good thing to, to look at, but I would say double stars are a very good thing to look at. Uh, double stars are colorful, and they're really, really very interesting to view. Uh, one of the few things you can look at and actually see color, double stars are great. Globular clusters, you can see globular clusters from the light polluted area. There's also, uh, there's plenty of bright nebula that you can see also. You can, I can see the Orion Nebula from my backyard. I can see the uh, Lagoon Nebula. Uh, there are many, many of the Messier objects you can still see even from a light polluted area. So that would be my suggestions on those. Okay. Uh, uh, additionally, where would you recommend we go within a short drive from the Clear Lake area for better night sky viewing with fewer trees and less city light pollution? Okay. Well, there's several places you can go. Um, the most obvious place is the George Observatory. You know, they've been shut down for a while for obvious reasons, but when they get going again, uh, every Saturday night, you can go out to the George Observatory, and there are star parties there. And you can look through other people's telescopes, or you can bring your own, set it up with convex scopes. Uh, that's that's that is much darker than where we are here in the Clear Lake area. Mm -hmm. uh, another place that you can go that I've enjoyed going is up at um, uh, Huntsville State Park. Now there are quite a few trees there, but there are places you can go that um, you know you can find clearings that you can use a telescope. I've had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, Huntsville State Park is fairly dark. All right. Uh, Brandon, back to you for a quick, quick question. Uh, is the monopole search still on? Um, You know, so it's kind of, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, there could be experiments looking for them. I, I don't know any off the top of my head. Uh, you know, the I was talking about the inflationary epoch. Um, so the idea behind that, you know, there was four big problems with, with the Big Bang uh, expansion. You know, if you were to reverse it all and go backwards in time, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't all be together. Um uh, as close as we would like it to be to, to reveal the uniformity that we see and, and the density of monopoles or lack of them. And so uh, that's sort of what led Alan Guth to come up with this inflationary uh, theory. So the idea is that there probably were mon monopoles, but, you know, because the universe expanded at least 26 orders of magnitude, they're very, very far apart and very rare. So I think the general consensus is that you know, people can't rule them out, but they probably are out there. So I wouldn't be surprised that folks are looking for them. But it's kind of like looking for the decay of a proton. It's probably not going to happen in our lifetime or, or the universe's lifetime. Okay. Uh, and then the last question uh, is related to uh, 
Jerry's presentation. And what I think I'll do, Jerry, because this has got a lot of background information in it, is I'll send it to you in the private chat and let you uh, try and respond to it. And you'll have to unmute your mic. All right. I'll look for it. Uh, it, it only put part of it in there. Okay, I see it. Let me just look at it for a bit. Uh, where did it start? Okay, well, let me let me read the question here, at least what we have. One question relates to the award of Nobel Prize to Penzias and Wilson instead of Dickey and Peels for the discovery of cosmic background radiation. Uh, I've never understood this as the Wikipedia entry below also notes accidental detection, which in my mind should be a much smaller achievement than the theoretical grounding which to give the gold medal. I even well, developed in the early 1960s, work on Brand's Dickey theory, led Dickey to think about the early universe with Jim people he re-derived, and it, it, it ends there. So um, let, me, let me just, I, I don't know if I can, I don't see the rest of the question, but um, my understanding of uh, Penzias and Wilson was that they were actually building a Dickey radiometry for radio astronomy. So they were trying to do radio astronomy and they had this background noise that they couldn't get rid of. And they tried, they eliminated a whole bunch of different uh, terrestrial sources, uh, other uh, uh, sources from space, and finally uh, came up with this idea. And I think that they probably talked to Dickey about it before they really came to the conclusion that this, this was the cosmic uh, background radiation. Uh, as you probably know, uh, none of these uh, discoveries or ideas uh, occur in isolation and they all are kind of part of a milieu of discussion. Um, but you know, the, uh, the Nobel committee often will look at who did it first and sometimes uh, they even look at who was the supervisor rather than the person who actually made the discovery. I think uh, maybe that occurred with uh, the discovery of pulsars, if I remember correctly. Uh, so um, I don't know if I've really answered the question and I didn't really see the rest of it, but I, I, I think that uh, the award to Peebles is maybe somewhat light in his career but it really is recognizing the body of his contributions rather than a single dis uh, discovery. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Back to Doug. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. Uh, and I assume that is it, so. Thank you very much for attending. Our next JSEAS meeting will be June 12th, where Leonard Ferguson will bring us The Road Goes Ever On, The Martian Rovers, and Our Path to the Red Planet. So thank you very much for attending, and I hope you can join us again next month. <laughs>